And we're recording. Welcome to episode four, four. of Marvelous. Four. It's, it's uh, the, the the first one we're recording in 2022. It, 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 we're, we're officially like in the 20s, the roaring 20s. We're in the roaring 20s. Uh, everyone get your short skirts, your bad bank investments, and uh, run over some ladies in the road and then get shot by your mistress's husband. That's a great Gatsby reference, everybody. Um, I've, I've never read new- that. <laughs> <laughs> that was an assigned, that was assigned reading in um, most American high schools, at least. But um, I'm your nuclear deterrent, Nicole. And uh, I got so bored watching this movie, I stopped halfway through to scoop the cat litter box. Um, and that's not like a lie. <laughs> That's that's not me he being did. cute. I really did. He did apparently. I really did. I was just like I was like an hour into this movie, and I was thinking, God, I I gotta scoop the cat litter box. I'm just I'm just gonna get that done. I'm just gonna get that done because I'm pet sitting. Um, this is this is the penultimate episode of the Stew is pet sitting arc. Yeah, I'm gonna podcast. I'm gonna be so much more lucid and have and be able to do so much more research when I'm home and getting a consistent hours of sleep um which i i'm not i i don't i don't i've i don't know if this is going to be even remotely interesting to anybody else but uh i don't like small anxious dogs but i signed myself up to look after one for uh, uh, the better part of a month uh, but it's it's almost over and i'll be going see, I, soon see i i currently work at a vet hospital my mom's the manager of it, so I work there like three days a week. So I'm seeing nothing but anxious friggin' dogs practically every day. Um, sometimes people bring in puppies, and that's always great. Like a lot of people are adopting golden doodles, which is wild. We get like maybe one of them each day, but were those? Anyways, I digress. Was that that <laughs> um, cereal from when I was a kid, golden doodles? That's clearly some Canadian. Shit, because I don't know what the hell no, you're just, talking I'm just, about. I, uh, swing and a miss. I just Golden Doodles sounds like a brand of cereal to me. That's all. Um, like well, I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> like Golden Doodles, right. it's a party in your mouth. Um, do you remember, okay. like, uh, okay, when cereal ads would just be like, "It's candy for breakfast." Oh yeah, like uh, the Reese's Puff cereal. Oh yeah, my they, God. Just we're, they just say it. They just say it. We're trying to talk about Iron Man too. We're already talking about cereal. This is how not good that movie is. We're like, let's please talk about anything else. But um, yeah, we're here to talk about Iron Man too, which Stu, you warned me about, um, and I didn't listen because I remembered this being. A lot better, and I I wasn't as bored as you were. Like I didn't have to go scoop up cat litter, most because I'm not living with another cat. Um, but I could really see the hand that this movie is playing. Like this movie shows its whole fucking neoliberal ass. It's really just really it it actually got me engaged seeing just how much of that is just blatantly thrown out there. Like it's not set on the least. It's so, I mean, it's the most interesting thing about it is how, and I, and I mean like, this is like interesting when you're, when you're like, like us trying to poke holes in it. Like this is, this is to find your own fun. This is like how people play Bethesda games when they're like, they're bad games, but they, they amuse themselves in them. Somehow, and, and this is when you watch a movie like this, you've got to keep yourself amused, and that's by poking holes in its internal logic. Because it's like it, 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 the first one, we 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 talked about all the politics and stuff, and this movie is like kind of the same, but even more muddled. And like whatever very soft critique of militarism in the arms industry it had, it starts it, it steps away even from that. Like the first movie kind of implies. Uh, Howard Stark, Iron Man's dad, Iron Dad, was a bad guy or a badish guy. He helped build um, the atomic bomb. He's he's kind of implicitly sort of described secondhand as a bit of a 
uh, a warmonger. And he's an absent father. Don't forget yeah. that. Because Tony has a lot of angst about his daddy issues. And this this movie is partly about that. <laughs> It kind of is, but then it kind of like every everything in this movie, it just like sets up all of this stuff and it doesn't really do anything with it and then just kind of resolves it and nothing goes anywhere. Um, I mean, the deus ex machina of this movie is Tony Stark invents his own element, which I, I wish what, I yeah, wish this had, which, I wish this was a dude sex machina movie and then him and. Uh, Don Cheadle, when they're in the Iron Men suits fighting, they just have robot sex. That would have been a better movie. That uh, that would have been a much better movie. Um, at least I, I at least I think we can agree that Don Cheadle is an upgrade over Terrence Howard. Oh, oh yeah, he 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 is. I mean, he's not that they 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 never they don't really see like they know what to do with the character, but he's a presence. Um, and whereas Terrence Howard is. Like uh, like just nothing in that last movie, but we already talked about yeah, that. Yeah, he's just weird and has uh, exploitable dick, as we learned on that episode. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> his, his, yeah, <laughs> it took you a minute. It's just funny to think about it. I don't um, know why. I... <laughs> but uh, sort of let's... Because this, this movie did become a slog. Um, I think I actually owned this on DVD we, at one point in we college. We had a Blu-ray. Uh, I um, dug up some because I'm, yeah. I'm house slash pet sitting. I I dug up some Blu-rays out of the basement, and it's like you know you have like we've got a bunch of Blu-rays and DVDs from like when all the video stores and HMVs and stuff went out of business. So there's like all these like Blu-rays that have like are still in the shrink wrap, and I pulled them. I was like Iron Man two. That's With awesome. That Chappie. We've got a we've got a Blu-ray of Chappie. It's never been you. It's never been watched. We, we, I've seen that movie like twice. It was always on streaming or on TV. I, just, I don't. I don't know how some of them got there. They were just like, it's five bucks. I can't lose. <laughs> In like 2011, and they just raided. Um- like a dollar store. Well, it's the bin, right? Like, like I re- like I was living in Vancouver. Yeah, oh, the the when Walmart HMV bin. Went yeah. out of business, and and then I back up here, our our video stores went out of business. You just slide on in there, and it's just like, man, like three bucks for a DVD, five bucks for a, a Blu-ray, not too shabby. <laughs> I, it's it'd be a waste not to buy yeah, it. And I mean, like some of those might pay off as like I don't know, like the streaming versions get like edited to take the swear words out or something. Oh, I did a whole, um, funny you mentioned that, Sue, because uh, a couple months ago I did a whole uh, piece on a local video rental store about like a mile away from me, the Video Underground. I love them. Uh, Kevin and Allison, if you're listening, hi. Um, And that was what our whole conversation was about, the fact that you need physical media because if stuff goes or remains exclusively on streaming, it becomes liable to being adulterated or edited or even removed entirely. So you can really do nothing but uh, have the physical copy of the disc, which is why a lot of boutique organizations like Criterion or Arrow Video exist. Um, but anyways, let's 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 talk about Iron Man 2 because that's what we're here to do. And I didn't mean to make that rhyme. But that's just what I do. That 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 classic A A A rhyme scheme. Um, so Iron Man two. I just like so this movie is just so badly structured. Um, it it sets up a bunch of dominoes, like a bunch of different things are going on. Um, uh, Tony Stark is dying of of palladium poisoning from the palladium core, which I don't. Is palladium an actual element? It's the palladium core of the arc reactor, so it's giving him blood poisoning. I think I think palladium is real, but they treat it like it's magic. Um, so, okay. so Tony Tony Stark has science magic poisoning from his science magic, and he's dying. Um, and then he's also, I mean, they kind of gesture at the. And this is one of those things I know secondhand, admittedly, um, the demon in a bottle plot, which I guess is like is really integral to. I was going to bring um, that up. Yeah. The comic book Iron Man. And this it's just sort of it's a byproduct of him thinking he's dying. That's dying. really all it is. He's, he's just he's, yeah. he's just 
So he starts partying and drinking excessively, whereas I, I'm pretty sure the demon in the bottle storyline was about Tony dealing with alcoholism. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't just a a, a secondhand thing. Yeah. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, Nick Fury is pestering him about stuff. Avengers stuff. Oh, because, no, well, Tony's acting too erratic and being too much of a big celebrity. See, it's six months later after the events of the first Iron Man, and Tony has completely embraced the fact that he's Iron Man. Like he's doing public appearances. The yeah, he's he's one of the like the second scene of this movie is him introducing Stark Expo when he shows up as Iron Man in front of all these. Uh, you know, scantily clad can canning girls set to fucking ACDC. Um, so he's, he's basically incorporated Iron Man into his entire celebrity. Like Iron Man, they show in the little uh, montage, opening credit montage that Iron Man was named person of the year. I, I mean, so what? I was named person of the year. And Iron Man apparently has brought about Complete world peace for at least the moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, don't even get me started. I mean, like, I get, I get, like, the movies are fantastical. You abstract things, but like, the idea that one guy with a robot suit can bring effectively world peace is. Uh, he solved the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. <laughs> apparently. I mean, he says. I I remember this. Yeah. He he says I've effectively privatized world peace, and it's like a big applause line, which is like. Yeah. Which is so gross. Hearing like pri- nothing should be privatized. Are you fucking kidding? Like, me? Like, like this is one of those movies where it's like maybe you could read it as maybe saying that might be bad, but it's so like ha- half-assed and non-committal that you can't really tell. And I'm not, and I'm not one of those well, like the satire has to be clarity of purpose, blah, blah, blah. But like, you, you, no, you, this you, is... if you're going to even gesture at these issues, you should have some kind of legible position. <laughs> this is like a Paul Verhoeven movie without the wink, like certain scenes of it, like that opening, or I should say second opening. Cause that's not the, the opening of the scene takes place in Russia. Well, well, there's a lot of fucking, ridiculous russia phobia shit going the on Russians. in this movie but the af- after yeah um the early like after credit scene is stark expo and it's just an it like the whole time i was thinking damn this feels like something out of starship troopers but you know what i just it really does no i just you yeah. know i just realized something and it, this is like a nitpicky continuity thing but it's sort of illustrative the the movie like seems to be taking place in like I don't know spring fall or summer some some season that's not winter because it's like the expo is open everyone's running around outside. Well, it's also California, too. So. But I mean, no, the expo is in New York, right? No, 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 because it's so, that no, because same. It's the it? it's the same fair. It's the same like world fairground. Oh no, it is because he says, "Oh, we're only two hundred fifty miles from DC," and jumps in the cards. Because it's that same. It's it's the Stark Expo ground oh, okay. is the world right. fair expo ground. Where that's also the location of the finale of Men in Black. I, I recognize those same two UFO towers, <laughs> um, which is a real a real place. Um, okay, I, so yeah, that's I that's that. I'm like ninety percent sure it's supposed to be happening in New York, but like, it, not, nothing is okay. winter in America. But in Russia, no, wait, no, you're right because the the little kid, the little kid in the Iron Man mask, that's apparently Peter Parker, as was yeah. retconned later on. Which so it's yeah. it's New York, and so it's it's like it's blatantly not winter in America, but all the scenes in Russia, it's it's winter, and Russia and the United States are in the same hemisphere. Like, well, it's it's cold like and Moscow dirty has too. and Saint Petersburg have warm summers. Um, like they don't yeah. and, and like like but like it's Russia, so it's winter all the time and everything's blue like blue sheen. Um and, and it's yeah. I don't like like it's it's just like it's little things, but it's like it's 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 very much like the stuff they made fun of in like Hume America World Police or other countries or just like these very, yeah. very Saturday morning cartoon pat like 
Well, I, one thing, like, this is a, I'm starting to notice a pattern, especially with these Iron Man movies. Like, Iron Man 1, we, we already talked about it. We went through just a handful of things that are very wrong about its politics and have aged really poorly. Um, But one of the things I brought up was the depiction of Afghanistan, or more specifically, or more generally, I should say, the depiction of other, like, world locations, particularly those that are associated with the bad guy. And that's, that's our opening scene. We are opening in Russia, and it looks just fucking miserable. Like, it's snowing, it looks dark and dingy. Um, and we are introduced to our villain, which funny, we had mentioned the wrestler in yeah, episode one, Mickey Rourke. because this is Whiplash, uh, is played by Mickey Rourke, who looks simultaneously like Tommy Wiseau and an aging pickup yeah, artist. Yeah, apparently, and like, I, I watched <laughs> the special features on the Blu-ray and, uh, I can see why they stopped bothering with that stuff. Cause it's, it's just, it's all like a really boring self suck. Um, but, like, apparently they say Mickey Rourke went to Russia and, like, hung out in Russian prisons to, like, learn how to be a... And it, it's so funny to, <laughs> to, to see... And I wouldn't shock me because, like, Mickey Rourke's, like, a weird guy who I could see, like, over committing. But it's also, like, for this movie, for this really stupid movie for where Iron they're Man giving you too. almost nothing to do to commit that hard to the to the bit. He just, he just speaks in... Very clipped sentences, uh, makes that mean mug and face, and has a pet bird, which apparently was Mickey Rourke's insistence that he have a pet bird and gold teeth. <laughs> okay. All right, Mickey. But, uh, which, I mean, like, any anything to make this character more of a something. Like, he's... Like, like I mean, this movie has a really stacked cast... And it's it's always a pity. I mean, this, we're going to see this with a lot of these movies. It's like a really huge cast, just a great cast is kind of wasted on really flat characterizations. And you can just you can see like him and Sam Rockwell are trying to make something of this movie and what they're given to do in it. But they just, you know, there's just not a lot there there. And it's I kind of feel for him. <laughs> like, yeah, Um but also during that very opening scene, we are shown various newspaper clippings, including the uh, Times Person of the Year, which went to Tony Stark, which is one of many weird meta, like, predicting the trajectory of Elon Musk's future. At least that's what my worm brain addled mind was picking up, because Iron Man 2 is also kind of infamous for being the movie where Elon Musk makes an appearance. And he does at the two, 26 minutes and 20, uh, excuse me, 57 seconds mark. Yes, I wrote it down. Um, so that's, uh, that's, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's get through the sort of the actual big opening establishing shit, because there's actually a lot there. Um, so it, again, it's six months later after Iron Man one, and Tony has basically become a symbol of world peace. He's apparently brought he has apparently just brought an uninterrupted period of world which, peace, which which is never um, like I know I said that twice, but yeah, they they really but hammer it's, it's that. It's never in, really fleshed out how minutes. he's done this, like like no. what he's done. It's just he he he's gone out. And and fought bad guys, and because he's gone out and fought bad guys, the world is basically it's basically saying like he won the war on terror with the Iron Man suit. I guess like it's not they it's never really explained who or what he's been because which is always the case with these movies because they don't want to take any kind of definite political position. Uh, uh, they they want to be as apolitical as they can get away with while really still appealing to liberal well, sensibilities. Well, while also having like um, – like that's the thing. They want to gesture at all of these themes, but they don't want to take any positions on them that might limit their audience because this is supposed to be a movie that everybody watches. It, it's it's 
Right. And that's kind of what I want to explore with the whole show is, is at the end of the day, all like all art, commercial art of any kind is like straddling, straddling this line between being like a work of art or at least like a entertainment craftsmanship and a commodity. And th- with, with the rise of, of Disney Marvel and, and, and how these, this whole franchise turns out, you see just the needle hard swing towards commodity in um right well the i mean the biggest issue with these iron man movies is that they take a salient political and international issue like the arms race the military industrial complex or the weapons industry and they use them to color a billionaire's white knight fantasy and these orgiastic displays of wealth it's vector is completely ne- neoliberal yeah and, in that and they want to ask the question like can 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 anybody can any one guy be allowed to like wield this kind of power but because the movie's about him and you're supposed to like him and they want to keep making iron man movies as long as they can and it's superhero stories in general they have to at least kind of mostly and they come down on yes or shrug their shoulders uh, yes uh, yes because and really the when you get down to it the reason Tony Stark can be Iron Man isn't because of anything very specific. Like you take this, if you completely deconstructed this and put this in a real world setting, if some fucking, if fucking Mark Zuckerberg had an iron suit, we would a all be clowning him and b everyone would be fucking terrified. But the reason Tony Stark can be Iron Man and why he's the only one who can be Iron Man is because he has swag and his technology works. Um, Yeah, only only he can (laughs) build this and Whiplash, apparently. Um, Well, well, no, because Whiplash... But not as good. You uh, still can't do it as good. It's it's not even an iron suit. It is like this iron rib cage, and then they come out with the laser whips i don't even know i how that didn't horribly burn his skin on that racetrack is beyond me um so anyways we're after we're introduced to our villain of this movie which uh mickey rourke during his uh the mickey rourke this was like after the wrestler so this was we're already nicely into the mickey rourke revival moment we kind of had in pop culture the, for a the while Rourke-naissance. um the Rourke, the Rourke Nassance is perfect. Um, oh, also I should note a screenplay by Justin Thoreau, the actor uh, from Lost Highway and uh, wait, no, he wasn't in Lost Highway. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking the other guy. No, Justin Thoreau from Mulholland Drive and Inland Empire. He was in Mulholland Drive? I haven't, yes, I haven't seen that, that Justin in a, Thoreau. A long time. Yeah. Yeah, he was oh, the director. Shit. He was the director. I mean, I don't know how much like you can who who get who gets cucked by Billy Ray Cyrus? I don't know how much you can really say he wrote this though, because I, I get the sense there was a lot of like, like the the Samuel L. Jackson stuff. I that too, but also like I feel like the the Sam Jackson Shield stuff is dropped in, feels really just dropped in from elsewhere. It feels very and, separate from the rest of the story. Yeah. But the reason, like, I want to say, like, it's it's hard to describe the plot of this movie because it doesn't have one. It's got this is a movie with a lot of this is a movie with a lot of and meanwhile and meanwhile. So let's let's just list them. Uh, Tony Stark is dying of palladium poisoning. The palladium core of the arc reactor is poisoning his blood, Um, and and he's also just sort of sad about his dad or like the the dad stuff is the solution to his sort of being confused about himself well, like because there's just- stark expo stark expo is also going on and i guess the connection yeah. is that stark expo the last one was in the 1970s so this was very much him taking up his father's mantle i guess who, who suddenly now has gone from like our like man of destruction to guy who had a, a beautiful space age vision for the future he was, was going to start an energy race, and he wasn't going to do it for the, a profit. The technology wasn't ready, but he's <laughs> handing the baton off to his son. Yes. Um, um, also, a 
Tony has decided to make Pepper his CEO because he is way too busy being Iron Man and likes it too much. Like Iron Man is now just a full on celebrity. And he's just bored of business stuff. Yeah. He doesn't want to be in the office. So, so Pepper becomes a girl boss, which means there is now an opening for Stark's secretary, I guess, introducing Natasha Romanoff, AKA black widow, but she's undercover. Uh, so this is uh, Scarlett Johansson's introduction into the MCU. Um, once again, playing another ethnicity of, of Russian redhead. Although, although they make no mention that she's Russian in this movie, which is really key to the character of Black Widow. Um, so meanwhile, because Iron Man has now basically, quote unquote, privatized privatized world peace and brought about just and no one's fighting. There is no more terrorism, at least for the last six months because of Iron Man. The but, United but States military. The, well, the United States military and just the United States in general are really looking to get their bureaucratic hands into whatever Tony Stark's going on. So they're, they summon him for a uh, Benghazi style test testimony um, in front of people where we are introduced to Tony's rival, a uh, fellow billionaire weapons manufacturer, Justin Hammer played by uh, the God Sam Rockwell and Sam Rockwell plays Plays this role very well as a billionaire with no swag. Like I, be I believe him as a billionaire with no swag. He he gives me the same embarrassing energy. Uh, that's really key to people like Mark Zuckerberg or actual uh, actor in this movie, Elon Musk. And I I think we both independently arrived at this conclusion, which is that. All the tech lord, billionaire, visionary guys that people are so hyped up about, they are all Justin Hammer. The The entire military industrial complex is Justin Hammer. There is no Tony Stark in real life. There's no, no Stark Industries in real life. It's 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 hammers all the way down. The the F-35 is um uh like like every major uh American military procurement project for the last 40 years is like that the hammer stuff where it's just it like barely works <laughs> it takes 30 years and it's just a grift because it's all the whole thing's a grift and that's what this movie could that's the thing this movie could do that it could go this whole arms military complex is a great big grift it's just the government it's it's just a way for corporations to bump up their stock price and and for CEOs and guys to pay themselves out of government spending that is facilitated by just everybody who's like 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 Rhodes and 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 and, and everybody like that just leave the military and join these companies and that that could, like that could be right they could have Tony Stark be your good guy who stopped making arms and it could be like a self-contained nonpartisan thing that you could if you wanted to j j approach these issues at all, that, that seems like a no brainer and they can't even do that because we've also got to like go to the air force base and just have like, like truck commercial shots of F 16s and B two bombers. And, oh God. and yeah, there's that. Montage. And just there's that other, montage other, where other... hammers showing off his weapons and it just, Oh no, that's no, that's oh. when, when Rhodey takes the Iron Man suit, to the Air Force Base. Yeah. It yeah. Just, and then the movie the, just then stops like, to like, yeah, they deck it out across. with the hammer stuff. Oh, after that. Yeah. But, but the movie just like stops dead to just zoom across. And it's like, it's set up like a, like a, like a, like a, uh, a car salesman showroom where it's like, we've got one B2 bomber and, and one F 16 and, and one, this and one that all just kind of like laid out in a row for the camera to, 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 to fawn over. Um, yeah, it, it's, it spends a obscene amount of time on just focusing on that sort of weaponry, which, like, I get it. I love Hideaki Anno, and he's famous for getting into the real details of machinery. But it's a lot different when it's actual military-grade weapons that are used to do major war crimes with, and it's being set to this 
fucking hard rock, like ACDC soundtrack. Oh my God. That's a sort of a sidebar, but like the use of rock music in this movie, like I know they used it a lot in the first one, but they really doubled down on this. And it's if so fucking cynical because just it, war profiteering and just there's there's nothing less hard rock than the military industrial complex. That is not that is not punk. That is not hard rock. Fuck that. I could see with the ACDC, but they've got him listening to the Clash. When that he's yes, away in his oh basement. My God. Which like the like Joe Strummer did the score for Walker, which is one of the most like searingly anti-imperialist movies to ever come out of like the American film industry um they had a have an, an album called sandinista like they supported the sandinista government oh, yeah. against the contras and against the u.s like they were um a, a dedicatedly anti-imperialist it's, it's music shameless. group it's, it's it, i mean shameless. it'd be like using rage against the machine like it would be the same kind of um thing like just uh well the i mean the entire purpose of it and I've been thinking about it since I rewatched it. The whole purpose of that is to be like, hey, isn't this cool? It is, again, window dressing to make this entire, like, Tony Stark cool. It is all a part of his accessory. It's his accessory. It is all a part of this conscious effort to market Iron Man and Tony Stark, the billionaire philanthropist, dickhead, tech lord, whatever, As someone who is cool, considering all the people who are closest to that in our reality, fucking Elon Musk is not fucking cool in the least. He's embarrassing. So, and I, you know, in the special features, they spend like a ton of time hyping up the fictional fake technology. Like, well, we've got the Iron Man suit Mark One and the Mark Two and the Mark Three, and then the Mark Four has got the triangle in it, which tells you it's a little bit different. And it's like obviously, like, oh well, we've got. All of these toys and Funko Pops and shit will be able to sell. <laughs> and all of all of these nerds who can go on Marvel Marvel Wiki and write articles about every slight variation of Iron Man's fucking suit. Like it's it, like like everything that like because I mean like I'm like like you mentioned Hideki Anno and his kind of like a lot of anime guys had like a little preoccupation with military hardware. I've got that, too. Yeah, like, that's your, those are your trains. By mil- yeah, I mean, like that. I mean, like I, I didn't need to look at the Wikipedia to tell me. Like, I know a fucking F sixteen when I see one. It, not, not, I mean, that's like one of the most easily identifiable military aircraft. But, um, but at the same time, like I also like reckon like you know I recognize like what they are and what they represent in their their, their context. But it's it, it's they understand how nerds love to 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 break everything down into its little types and versions and and spurred out over it and and they are relentless at exploiting that to keep people invested in the brand um and it goes down to just the little thing the, the, the little things like the the constant fetishization of of the the pe- peculiarities of of um iron man's technology and and it, they were like really just like into that in the special features um which which brings me to another thing uh, if if you aren't if go, I'm not go. interrupting it's, you, um, no. So I don't I don't know if I talked about this a lot in the first one, but there is no like Stark employees really. No, you don't. Like see we're told any of this, the this whole company employees. exists, but like everything Tony Stark does, he just he does in a cave or he does in his basement with a bunch of robots. Like like they know like he can't literally just build all this stuff by hand, but they make it as close to that as they can get. No one else is involved in the process. Like when when in reality any sort of technology like this would be built on a foundation of generations of research and development requiring hundreds, thousands of researchers and engineers, plus like a whole labor force to build and assemble it. Um, yeah. They, they kind like of really- there, there aren't even con- Like there aren't even contractors fixing his yeah. house. Like, no. like, again, I get things need to be abstracted for a movie. I'm not, I'm not complaining about the lack of realism, but the, the absence of, any sort of workforce or anything in this, it, any it's, any interns being suggest at. like it it tells us more about the ideology just implicitly subconsciously reflected in how these these movies are put together and the 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 
the the mindset behind the people making them, which is like like people in Hollywood all think not all, but I'm just say like yeah. it, like you can tell there's a lot of people in Hollywood who think who like buy into the even if they're like I think kind of progressively minded people in a lot of ways. Like I like you watch like interviews or Twitter posts and stuff like hype. There, there's this kind of in, I think there's a sort of insular circle of quote unquote Hollywood people. Uh, or relatively insular and things just like build hype there. Um, and, and like Elon Musk is one of them. Like, like for some reason, if you're in that circle, you're getting all the good propaganda about him. You probably meet him at parties and he makes a good impression and his cars seem so cool. And you think, well, here's a guy who's making the world a better place by making electric cars and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. He wants even to if collab not, on like, an electric jet with Tony Stark, which I'm sure would definitely work. Well, you know what? I mean, well, it wouldn't be a jet because if it's electric, it's just a turbine on an electromagnet. But if – like here's the thing. Like this arc reactor technology – and they say like like it's part of the plot in this I, – I mentioned this in the first bit. In this one, it's like referred to directly when he has like – he watches the film reel of his dad and his dad's rehearsing and getting mad. And then he just stops and is like, Tony, someday you're going to watch this and I've got a message for you. And how I'm going to convey that message to you is to 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 leave it in the outtakes of an old film reel that would could easily be thrown out. I'm not going to write you a letter or, or anything. Um about how someday this technology will be ready and you'll bring it to the future. It's like they're directly saying like this arc reactor technology is going to change the world and it would. But the consequences of that are never felt like no. if you can generate can- that kind of energy at that kind of scale. Yeah, you can have an electric jet. You can you can solve the energy, the world's energy problems. You can solve global warming like you could probably like forget the Iron Man suit. You could bring about world peace just by creating such a massive supply of 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 energy yeah. that like every country in the world could could cleanly and sustainably like industrialize and desalin- like desalinize seawater to create fresh water in places that are being desertified and like just kind of solve like almost every soluble major world problem um at the technological level at least well and now that I think about it, like going back to how you don't see any other Stark employees, everything that we see technologically, we usually see Tony physically working on it. I think that's also part of this deliberate effort to market his character as cool because you get the impression, oh, he's like a blue collar mechanic who works with his hands. He's not some snooty guy sitting in this, you know, nice chair in this high rise, the desk. He doesn't actually do anything. He doesn't actually get his hands dirty. And it's this it's is, the garage yeah. CEO. It's it's Steve Jobs and Wozniak and in, in the mythology of their like origin in the garage soldering Apple ones. Yeah. Like it's, they want, he's high tech and rich already by like necessity in the inherited lore, but they also want him to be that like, and like Stark Industries has no shareholders. It has no board of executives. Like, like Batman, like even in the Batman, like we, what we which did the dark Knight, even that like Wayne enterprises has got uh, like, has a board of executives. Yeah. Who, yeah, that was who are at least yeah. mentioned in passing. Like, and again, it's not a, a realism thing per se, but it's more like structuring reality in a way that reinforces this idea of just like one lone genius can single handedly revolutionize the world top to bottom. No one else is involved. Right. Like there's right. Uh, like it's the vision of Elon Musk where there is the, the people working in his factories basically don't exist um, and don't matter. Um, the actual economics don't exist and don't matter. It's just genius guy has a great idea, brings that idea in reality and it changes the world for the better. And he's great and is justly rewarded for being great. Eh. I, I guess I think we might as well just talk about Elon a little bit more or, or at least his appearance in this movie. Um, cause as I, he does appear at exactly 26 minutes and 57 seconds. I know because I wrote it down, um, because he, you hear from off screen, I think T- Tony goes, ah, Mr. Musk. And my stomach just dropped. Like I knew this was coming, but it, it it's, it still felt like someone grabbing me from behind. 
at, um, at least I at least like at least I expect this movie to be this bad. Like it was right. a lot more of a oh, it I was knew. a lot more of a gut punch when he showed up in Rick and Morty. Oh, which ew. was like, yeah. That's, oh, it's brutal. It's bad. And I mean, he's a bad like he's he's a very flat unfun voice actor he gets no. a whole lot of done because he was like rick he was on twitter like rick and morty is real epic and i love pickle rick and he yeah. dm'd justin roiland and dan Harmon, who were so excited to have the awesome electric car <laughs> genius be a fan of their show and, <laughs> so and i mean it, the show had already fallen off but it was just like really emblematic of the yeah where, like it did it, it compressed like 14 seasons of the simpsons rise and fall into four um god um yeah but anyway uh, elon musk shows up he's part of the vip club gathering at the monaco race track grand prix i think because tony's also got to make an appearance at the grand prix because i guess he also owns a race car um but he he shows up and he is as shiny and rosy cheeked as the little debbie's girl <laughs> that's all i thought <laughs> when i saw him <laughs> He oh, he's like gotten so much little, plastic little surgery girl. done. Yeah. He, Have you ever seen what he looked like when, like, he was getting rich off PayPal? And he, he like shit. He looks he like, looks like 60 shit. and he's balding. And he just, well, he looks like, he, he looks like a, he looks like a something awful forum poster <laughs> who's like a cis admin. Like, yeah. And, and he's gotten so much plastic surgery done and, and, and steroids. Like, I believe all that stuff about him. Oh, he does <laughs> not look human anymore. And I, none and, of them do. And now do. it's coming back to haunt him. He he looks really shitty now. Like, he's like, like, like everything that they put in him is just like failing. It's really funny. Um, well, also, and here, here was a theory I came up with while watching this movie. Cause again, as this, I didn't, I, wasn't I wasn't entertained enough by this movie to the like I I thought it was a slightly better movie than Hulk like Hulk was just I, I actually would say Hulk you you is, disliked it you disliked this a lot I more would I Hulk. would actually maybe prefer I mean there's it's like I mean you know it's it's like which garbage do you slightly prefer yeah um I, so uh out I I was less I was I think I was less engaged by this because I remembered it. Maybe because I remembered it better. Okay. Um, whereas the Hulk movie, it had been, my memories were so fuzzy. There was a little bit of like, oh yeah, and then this happens, which, uh, I don't know. It's both terrible. Like that's, I, I like it's kind of crazy. The the, yeah. the Marvel thing got to Avengers after putting out Incredible Hulk and Iron Man 2 in back a row. Back to back they're both birds. Just dull dull movie um, but anyways my theory and i wonder if you agree with this is that ever since appearing in iron man 2 because apparently elon musk had a lot of contact with the production of both iron man like they toured musk uh or tesla facilities during the pre-production of iron man one and i guess elon musk had a lot of just gave a lot of free consulting to the production on Iron Man 2 or something like there was a strong free, relationship free, there free. but okay well, so by consu- I mean, I'm mean, going to just interject and say like we should put like uh, quotes around consulting a little asterisk and yeah. then uh, at the bottom of the text that the ast- at the asterisk or the annotation it says um uh self promotion so yeah but anyways my theory is ever since appearing in Iron Man 2 do you think Elon Musk has been consciously trying to model his life after Tony Stark in the MCU. Because again, there were moments in this movie that made me think, geez, just Elon Musk literally did that shit this past year. Like the the person of the year, the fact that Tony Stark is having a very major emotional fucking breakdown in public to the extent he's partying and pissing in the Iron Man suit. Like that's that's something I can kind of see. I mean, granted, we haven't seen Elon Musk go absolutely ape shit. I I sure would well, like well, to, but he, his Twitter his Twitter meltdowns are pretty infamous. Yeah, I mean, I would I would love to be a fly in the wall when he's just like. I mean, you, you, who is it that was like supposed to like go record a song with Grimes? Was just like Azalea Banks at his house with them. Azalea Banks. Oh my god, that, I love that story. It, she was trapped find, there. <laughs> 
for for like a week, a long <laughs> weekend week. with Musk while he's just being a dork and doing a bunch of drugs and, and being an <laughs> idiot was, on Twitter and, and, and like trying like, to fuck her. Was like, you smell like granolas. Or so, oh my god, I I love you, Azealia. If you if you haven't seen those, um, it's so just like funny. Google Azealia Banks, Elon Musk, Grimes, whatever, it's and you'll so find funny. a bunch of articles and screenshots of her Instagram where she was posting stuff. It's it's, so good. it's hysterical, and I, I I believe all of it. She was the one that coined the nickname Apartheid Clyde. Yes, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And anyways, we we stand Azealia. We we stand Miss Banks. A, a little glimpse into the world of this guy who's just uh, just a, a complete mess of a person uh um, we also shouldn't forget though the other infamous celebrity cameo in this movie is uh uh sex pest bill o'reilly also appears oh yeah as himself that was yeah, that was a, unforgivable because at that at that point we'd already knew he'd he'd already gotten into a sex scandal with leaving a woman a really disgusting sexual voicemail about wanting to be a loofah and rubbing her body or some shit. It was, it was really gross. And then it happened like in 2005 or something. I love when people's like sexts and messages leak and they're just like really embarrassing. I love you alive girl. Oh God, that will never not be funny. Like just, I'll say that in my grave. No, no blood in his body. It (laughs) rules. Oh, uh, but I, I think like the reason we're even more than usual kind of uh, like spiraling in an erratic orbit around this movie is because it, it really is just like two action sequences. And then just in the middle, there's a bunch of just plot threads that just sort of dangle and then resolve themselves like 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 the whole thing where he's dying and he's drinking. He has that big fight. With Rhodey, Rhodey, war, which war which machine. serves to get him the Iron Man suit that he can take to the army and become War Machine, I guess. But then it's just like, um, uh, uh, Nick Fury gives him a thing that's like, this will stop you from dying for now. So I guess you kind of owe us. And then a little bit later, it's just he he watches that video of his dad. And then he re- and this is like some I don't know why this is in this. It's like this stupid Indiana Jones shit for 30 seconds where he realizes that the Stark Expo Center is like a map. And when you it's decode the nucleus it, of it, an it, atom, it tells you how to make a new element. And then he, he makes a new Iron Man heart that has a triangle on it. So, you know, it's different. And that cures him. And then that's it. He's cured. Being Iron Man isn't killing anymore anymore. All of that. Like what could have been really interesting dramatic tension where it's like this thing that gives his life meaning that makes him famous that is like helping the world within the logic of the universe is also killing him. He doesn't come to any solves itself. He doesn't come to any emotional reckoning. That's the thing. It does. Yeah, it just kind of solves itself. It's really weird and anticlimactic. And then it's like, and, and okay, this this killed me. So he's he's watching this old nuclear age footage of his dad doing like the Walt Disney presentation thing. Like his dad seems like to be like shifted from being like Robert Oppenheimer to being Walt Disney. Yeah. Oh, well, they're both. Apparently. Yeah. Although like, I mean, at the end of the day, if we look at how everything played out, I feel like Walt Disney's done a lot more harm to the world. Yeah. I mean, look at, we're literally doing a podcast. That's like the big domino and his, the little domino is, He's he, you know, drew a picture in nineteen fifty. Disney, or Disney, and Oppenheimer are equally responsible for giving us anime. So that's yes, thing, yes. Guess. Oh, you could absolutely make that argument. Um, can we talk a little bit about the Ben? I, I'm, I'm offhandedly referring to it as the Benghazi scene. Just because yes, but I just want to finish my thought. Yes, and, and then okay. We'll do that. Um, so this whole thing where he's watching the this film footage of his dad being the epic scientist giving these presentations about the glorious future pro is is just like uh, a, a recurring like it happens in a couple episodes. I, I mentioned this on the first like Venture Brothers, which is mm-hmm. about like the fail son of a of a epic mid century super scientist, um, and. He, there's a lot of that. Like he's watching, like you see this old corny footage of, of uh, 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 Rusty Ventures 
dad, uh, the the great genius scientist guy uh, with his big booming voice, like, aha, the world of tomorrow, we'll do this and that. Uh, welcome to my big space station. And, and in, in this video where, where he, where Howard like stops to like talk to his son who he knows somehow will someday watch these fucking deleted scenes. Um, and he says to him, like, you're my greatest invention. And and I swear to God, that line or one very much like it is in Venture Brothers in a context like that before this movie came out by years. But it's like in that show, it's like played off as like, this is extremely corny. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's and super stupid. cliche. It's super and cliche. It's, it's funny to see something like so on the nose just like something being parodied coming out years after, like, like it almost makes me wonder, like if, if somebody involved in this didn't actually watch venture brothers, just go, well, we could just play that straight and it'd work for this movie. Cause it really, it really feels like that. Like it's uncanny. Like it's just, it's it, Iron Man, especially too, is just the version of venture brothers where rusty is actually also cool and epic at science. Yeah. Which, you know, sucks. <laughs> It's it's super corny, um, but so is Justin Hammer. Um, and in the scene, sort of the scene that really actually jogged my brain the most, or and by that I mean really shows the politics of this movie in full force, is what I'm casually referring to as the Benghazi scene. Uh, Tony Stark is summoned to testify in front of uh, Congress, a la... Hillary Clinton on the Benghazi hearings. So, and he's also acting real sassy about it. Um, Cause the U S government oh, yeah, just, wants, just... to, wants to have some <laughs> sort of control over or jurisdiction over the use of the Iron Man suit. They see it as a potential weapon. Um, actually they have Rhodey come and make a statement to testify. And what does he say? I have it written down he um he quotes a section of his report and he's like well it's out of context and you know the stupid dickish center editor is like read the thing and so Rhodey says uh according to his report as iron man does not operate with any definable branch of government iron man presents a potential threat to the security of both the nation and our interests so accordingly <laughs> AKA the government doesn't see Iron Man as a threat to other nations, but as a threat to us as a weapon that could turn against us, not a weapon that could easily wipe out a small nation because they had an election that didn't swing towards American interests or fucking whatever. Um, like there is a lot going on in this scene. Like there, it really shows its own ass. So it's, I, yeah. And, and like, there's very much like, they're kind like Gary Shandling is like this, this shit heel congressman who's, who's leading this thing. Um, rest in peace. Uh, to oh, a great he one. died. Uh, a while ago. I'm pretty oh, sure. Yeah. All right. All right. You know actually, let me, uh, let me look that up. Oh. Maybe I'm <laughs> I thought I was pretty sure. He's not actually dead. <laughs> no, no. March 24th, 2016. Oh, RIP. Um, but yeah, but, uh, there's, a, there are a lot of things said in this scene. Like Tony openly refers to himself as a nuclear deterrent, which means Iron Man is basically America's big stick. Um, he also says I have successfully privatized world peace, which is a fucking mind blowingly shitty thing to say. Uh, and then he, he also says, you know, he, he, he basically owns being Iron Man to the extent of just saying like, oh, we're one, we're one and the same. Like you can't, you can't have the Iron Man suit because I am the Iron Man suit. Like it is Iron Man is me. Um, so again, really, really emphasizing the, the fact that no one else can be Iron Man except Tony Stark. Because if you try to make Iron Man without Tony Stark, you get corny ass Justin Hammer. Uh, AKA Sam Rockwell, who again really does a good job at being a slimy, uh, swagless billionaire. He, he's 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 doing everything he can with what he's got. He um, he does not get nearly enough screen time, or or at least not enough screen time, not enough things to do because he is also the other villain 
of this movie. It's later revealed that he is recruiting uh, Whiplash, Anton Yakov, or is that Anton? Ivan. 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 Anton is the father. Ivan Um, Vanko. Ivan Vanko. I've... Guys, if, Which, if you I, have, I don't even if you know have if that your, checks out as a real like yeah. Russian or Ukrainian or whatever name. Guys, uh, if you have your bingo sheet open, and please put your marker on Nicole mispronounces something really stupidly. It, that's that's it for the episode. Um, but the other thing, sort of to go away from the Benghazi scene, it's revealed that uh, Yankov's father. Anton had worked on the technology that would become the miniature arc reactor with Howard and that Howard later had him deported (laughs) back to the Soviet Union um, because apparently, hold on, I wrote it. I wrote it down very nicely. Give me one yeah, sec. At, at first it's like a seems like a justified revenge yeah, thing, the, but then Nick Fury comes in and says, "Well, actually, your father had him deported because he wanted to monetize the technology." Which, like, <laughs> Howard Stark's an arms salesman. How? He wasn't what? <laughs> yes. What? So first of all, so Howard Stark is the good guy in that scenario because he wanted to use the arc reactor's technology to start, quote unquote, an energy race. But Anton Yankov was bad because he wanted the reactor to get rich, as if the two aren't fucking mutually exclusive. Yeah, I don't. And our, like, an energy thing. race would have made Howard Stark billions of dollars. I mean, that's the thing. All the bad guys in these movies are constructed, so you don't really stop to ask what makes the good guys good. It's just they're not bad. Yeah. Right. You you don't ask why they defend the status quo because they're always whatever they're fighting is always worse. So whatever is good, whatever is positive is just an implicit absence of whatever bad thing is presented precisely so these movies can largely avoid taking any kind of real ideological position or at least a well, no, not a, a clearly defined ideological position. All the all the ideological positions are just implicit. Yeah, Um, so basically, guys, the bad guy of this movie is literally the son of a Red Scare and anti-communist victim who defected from the Soviet Union and then was ratted out by by Howard Stark. You know what? Serves him right for defecting. Yeah, serves Serves, him right. Serves him right for defecting. I mean, if you're going to build this amazing technology, you build it in the Soviet Union. If they had that, if they had just like this unlimited access to energy, they would have made communism work and uh, we would live in just like a way better world. than the one we live in now. Yeah. um, Um, I mean, to my understanding, the reason even a lot of Marvel people think this movie is pretty stinky is mostly the fact that they feel Whiplash was not a strong enough enemy to Tony Stark, or at least not a fleshed out enough villain. When the problem is really like stuff like this, Like, when you look at it and it's just like, what the fuck? There's just just no dramatic tension. And the movie, like I said, there's there's an action piece kind of at the near the beginning uh, at the 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 Monaco race, which I mean, also fuck Monaco. Just fuck those those tiny little countries that are just like vacation places and and, and like tax havens for rich people. Yeah, they're not con- you're not fuck countries. Them. You're not fooling anyone. There's, fucking Monaco. Did you ever see that movie with? I think it was Nicole Kidman, Grace of Monaco. No, I heard Grace it Kelly was married real bad. Married though. the Prince of Monaco. It's really bad, but I I, I I I caught it once a few years ago on TV, and my mom was watching it or something, and, and it's like. The thing that kills me about it is it's like the whole plot is like it's when Charles de Gaulle like threatened to annex Monaco. And it's all about how like Grace Kelly stepped up and helped them save the country by like getting the word out. And it's like, no, Charles de Gaulle should have annexed Monaco. Fuck Monaco. <laughs> Why shouldn't Monaco be part of France, uh, a, a republic instead of uh, this this little leftover of feudal fiefdom where, where, where rich people go to party? Like, like <laughs> And, yeah, Sorry, that's just a, a digression I wanted to get out because I, I, I am a very, I'm very anti Monaco. I just, I just had to get that out there. Um, but that, like that, I'll say, like that's a solid action set piece at least. Um, there's it a is, lot of it like is solid, yeah. There's some. There's a lot yeah. of like real cars really flipping around and blowing up, or at least real cars green screened or, or, or things like. It has like enough real sets and props that is just like. You know, we're not going to see as much of that after 
Avengers one, like actual sets and props and costumes. Yeah. Um, Although I'm, I am still really <laughs> holding out shooting. for uh, Captain America because that is, that is a period piece. And when you have a period piece, you do get nice sets. So I, I again, I'm really holding out for that one. And also I just really want to see Chris Evans again. Um, but <clears throat> anyways, there's also the f- Yankov is right. Like here's the thing with a lot on, of a lot of these Marvel. Yankov. What is it? it Vanko. Vanko. Oh. Yeah. I th- are, you, are you thinking of 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 Yakov Smirnov? No, I have it written down as Yankov. I don't know why I did that. But <laughs> this is again. All right. If you have Nicole mispronounces the villain's name in this movie on your bingo card, mark that fucking shit off too. Um. But yeah, I'm just gonna fucking Mickey Rourke. There we go. Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke is literally right, though, to be angry. He oh, at completely. one point, he literally says to Tony Stark, you come from a family of thieves and butchers. And now, like all guilty men, you try to rewrite your own history. And he's 100 percent right. Oh, he's though. totally right. I had I had that line written down. He's right. Like a good line, honestly. Um, and that's that's the thing with these movies is I wonder, like. Is this just a half-assed gesture to diffuse criticism? Or is there like somebody or some element of the production wants to have this critique, but then it's like stifled by because the Tony studios. So they, they're cool. trying to trying to so they're trying to just kind of like say I think you see that a lot in like movies and TV where there's like at least some of the writers or somebody involved wants to push on these contradictions. But just has to sneak it in at like I, the the the, yeah, the most tiny bit diffuse homeopathic level, or is know, it though. or is it just a a marketing gesture so that they can trick middle? Because I think that's a big thing with Marvel movies and Disney in general is they'll like they will like before the movie even comes out they'll like f- have the 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 clickbait places going like there's this gay subtext in this or this subtext or Black Panther is all about. Uh, decolonization, yeah, and and they'll seed. It's it's like a, a slight digression, but I, I swear it'll pay off. Um, I believe you. Ha- have you ever heard like of backmasking, like like backwards messages hidden in music? Yeah. Oh, like Paul is dead. Yeah, yeah. There's there's real ones, but they're always really obvious because they sound really yeah. clear when you hear them backwards, and then they sound like gibberish played forwards. Um. But there's ones like, uh, you know, the the Led Zeppelin one, like uh, in the tool shed where he took us, my sweet Satan, whatever it is, right? The uh, the stare at heaven one. Um, you don't those ones that are just like like um, pareidolia kind of oral pareidolia, I guess, where like people find meaning in this gibberish because um, their brains are pattern matching. Yeah. Um, you you. I remember listening to some of those that are supposed to be in the, and it just sounds like gibberish. And I read what it's supposed to say, and suddenly I can hear it because I'm like been prompted to find the pattern. And I think Disney and like these companies in general, like a, a lot more now than they did then, probably. But it's probably always been a thing. So is they seed using like BuzzFeed articles, Refinery Twenty Nine, whatever. They seed these ideas into the public consciousness before people see the movie. So that they can see a movie that has like no real substance, but then project what they're expecting to see bias. onto it. Yeah. Sort of. Like it's like it's it's a very shallow pool, but it's reflective and you see reflected in it what you've been prompted to see. Yeah. And so like I don't know, is like is someone somewhere in the production process trying to be generally subversive but just can't very really get away it's, with it? Or so, I, is this an exercise in, in that just prompting you to think there's more going on than there is. And then- but still, I don't, I don't know because here's the thing, like this movie also has an opinion on drones and it seems to be leaning towards drones are bad, or at least drones are bad because they're not manned by Tony Stark. Uh, Dr- like- drones are, drones are bad because they're inhuman and they don't make human decisions and they kill indiscriminately. But, to me, honestly, like a drone isn't going to panic. A drone isn't going to be like racist. I mean, it might, <laughs> there's that implicit like we don't have, we can't, can't have racist races, drones in the military. But like a drone isn't going to be ideologic. Like a drone doesn't have an ideology. A drone doesn't panic. The, guy, drone the person doesn't fear for its own does. life. 
I, I mean, they might, but like you're, you're you're sitting like in a. I mean, I'm also talking about like totally automated, like yeah. using drone for both remote control, like totally automated. But like the the fear of autonomous killing systems, like there's like I get what's scary about it, but I also like people are scary. Like a, a computer wouldn't do the Holocaust. <laughs> You know, it wouldn't yeah. have any reason to. A computer wouldn't do the. Uh, a computer wouldn't commit war crimes or torture anybody because there's no reason for it to do it. So I, I don't know. It, it seems hypocritical to me. This whole drones bad thing, especially with well, the Obama administration. Oh my being god! Like and did you ultimate- catch the Shepherd's Ferry uh, Iron Man poster that they bl- flagrantly oh, showed? Oh yeah, the, that was so the, cringy. I mean, it was I 2010. Mean, I feel like if, if if Iron Man was real, like somebody would do that. Like oh. I kind of did that with everybody who was a celebrity. Oh, you could buy still, that just, like, at like Newbury self-suck. Comics or any or, oh, like my God. Spencer's who? gifts. I'm trying to imagine the person that would actually buy that. And that's. Ugh. We're at some point, like we're going to have to like, like maybe just as a standalone episode, just like really drill dive down on like the, the Marvel cult. And and why the there is one like because there's people on there that are like we failed to make this movie a hit and we're not going to let it happen again like that. Justice for proof. Black Widow. Like oh, that that's shit. so. Oh my god, that that shit where it's like a fictional character dies and you're like treat it like it's a real crime. Like, yeah. Although, can, also, you know like, what? Nice segue. Can we talk a little bit about Black Widow? Because this is this is kind of. This is kind. Of, this is kind of. We're getting a little bit into the area that I'm an expert in, which is the gender shit, because this this movie does have the distinction of being the first um, appearance of a female hero in the MCU, which is Black Widow. Um, Scarlett Johansson never wears that wig again. The long, oh, yeah. curly red hair. She she either has the like bob that she has in Avengers, or the very straight pin hair that she has in Captain America 2 and then in the I, end game it's like half blonde or it's, it's like a b- bad they, they really bad can't roots. decide what they want to do they with can't that. decide but they never bring this wig back which I was just it I was just looks saying, very much like a wig uh I saw during I I gleaned just because I, I was watching that uh behind the scenes stuff and there was a lot of her they were really hyping her up like Scarlett Johansson as an action hero and how good she was at the stunts and stuff um and committed but like there was a lot of like stunts and stuff she was practicing I don't remember seeing in the movie and I'm wondering if at some point she had more to do uh than she does and also I just wanted to say like you know uh in terms of gender stuff in terms of like modern sensitivities uh uh the the male gaze representation they had a much more tits out costume for her i saw in that behind the scenes stuff oh, and i'm really they? disappointed they didn't use it oh yeah like really like like really out i believe that because her introduction is actually pretty bad <laughs> from from this oh, it, perspective it, like the first time we see her in the actual Black Widow garb, it is a dolly shot of her ass approaching the table where Tony and Nick Fury are eating donuts. Like, it is literally, the frame is literally centered on her ass. And then later oh, totally. she's undressing the back of Happy Hogan's car. She's like down to her bra and they make a whole joke of it. But I th- in the rare, in a very rare instance where I think we can probably agree Scarlett Johansson was right, she later went on to say that she felt Natasha was very hypersexualized in this movie, um, which more, I, I more see so it. than in the later. Yeah. Movies, oh, absolutely. She. I mean, her her very first scene as she's like undercover as a legal person, potentially going to be. Pepper's successor now that Pepper's. Been oh, and her her rivalry CEO. with Gwyneth Paltrow is just like hinted at in one scene and then never pays off. It never. Off. It doesn't feel like a rivalry. Like it's at another. All. It's another one of those plot threads because it's like you know Tony's like and I mean like I get the idea like oh she's infiltrating this agency so she's using Tony's womanizing as a way to get close. Weaponized to Weaponized femininity, yeah. Yeah, 
Which, like, fair enough. And then, oh, Pepper Potts is sort of jealous. And then, like, there's, like, one scene where they kind of snip at each other a little bit. And then it just kind of goes away. Like, it's another, like, of, of one of those plot threads in this movie or, or potential sources of tension, I'll say, that is just kind of left limp and dangling or resolved in an anticlimactic hand wavy way. I, I feel um, like, and this is, so this is 2010. So this is before what I would call, like, the resurgence or, like, the the beginnings of what we would probably now call like fourth wave feminism. So there weren't these conversations about the sexualization of women in media that are now just think pieces all over the place nowadays. We, we, but, we could still j- just like, sort of take it for granted that like you just had a woman in a slutty costume. In but a movie. I never, it was a better it, time. It feels like they kind of, they were like, Oh, we don't really want to do this sort of, you know, two women cat fight sort of thing in our it it feels like the production, or at least John Favreau was like at some point, eh, it's a little too cheap for this movie to have like a cat fight, and so they sort of backed away from that. And so I mean a, a literal cat fight yeah. maybe, but like the, the the tension of like two women sniping at each other. They never they like, never that get could be snipey. fun. They never like, get snipey. I mean, like, potentially. No, like, it could have been No fun. weave is pulled. No, no, no one, like, no one screams at each other. It's really just Pepper looking at Tony and being like, you know, keep your hands to yourself. She's a potential sexual harassment lawsuit. And that's basically it. More or less. So there's, there's really no dramatic tension in that whole plot line so it it feels like black well there's Widow no dramatic just doesn't tension have, in anything yeah. like after <laughs> the first action sequence this movie just goes limp and then we get our perfunctory ending action sequence where iron man fights a lot of other iron men um yeah. which is like the iron man on iron man fighting is just the most boring parts of all these movies um and it's just like it it like 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 it goes from being totally limp to like twitching a little bit uh, You're poking about it with it. a like, stick. Yeah, it's like do something. <laughs> do, Come please. on, do something. Um, like you just imagine like the movie, just like I'm so sorry, this never happens to me. I'm just a little nervous. You're so beautiful. Yeah, it's uh, it just and it it feels like it really is trying to be epic because apparently they really intended to have the sort of I think they call it like the Japanese garden scene at least the the climactic war machine and iron man fighting all the drone hammer bots or whatever as like the core big like action set piece of the movie and it just it doesn't feel that epic although i did i do have to i do get entertained seeing like robots fight each other that's just a I very mean, me thing it's not like a, it's not like terrible it's not terrible anything, but it's just like lots of cgi iron man flying around shooting at each other and you well, never really get like a strong sense that anybody's in danger and it's it's got that kind of like lack of that that lack of tension and that lack of oomph that so many superhero fights suffer from yeah um although i will say the the earlier fight between Rhodey and tony like at his after after he's oh yeah, I guess that is another suit. action they're sequence using, too. I swear to God, they're are they're using stock sound effects because there's like a punch thrown. It's like a boink. It's like a cartoon sound effect. Well, it's because they're playing that. it. They're playing it so hard for laughs. They don't want to go. Yeah. Like the the pondering your the, either the alcoholism or pondering your own mortality. Like they they're just so afraid to go even a little bit dark with it that they just. They, they just make it into a, a farce. So you get this big slug it out to Iron Man boxing scene, which has like, I mean, like they, 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 they rip up a lot of that house. There's at least some. There's so much property damage. It, it's, it's got that, that has a little more oof. Cause they're like, 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 like actually blowing up the, they're using partial real suits with some CGI for like the legs. And they're using um, like, you know, you, you CGI a guy being thrown into a wall, we have a real wall collapse. So it feels more tactile, but it's like, because they're, because it's so played so goofy and it's so low stakes, it has no tension and is just doesn't mean anything. It's like, it doesn't, the, the the movie is 
so af- it, it's like the, the the and I think this might be where it was like a lot of studio stuff uh, I- I intervening is the movie is so afraid to go at all dark or to or to scare anybody that it can't pay off any of the dramatic tension it tries to set up. Yeah. Um. So it's it, it that's how you end up with it just kind of flopping around until it ends. And um, I now that you mention, I think sort of in general when it comes to these comic book movies and superhero movies, it it needs to have just the right balance of dark, serious content to more lighthearted, fun, poppy sort of stuff. Like, I think that's what made something like Spider-Man 2, which I think we could both agree is sort of the superior, uh, I mean, and like the Dark Knight or something. But more Spider-Man 2, at least to me, is that perfect sweet spot between, you know, the like kitschy elements and then the more darker, serious, emotional stuff like that. That really strikes a good balance. And here it's again, it's just. You know they're they're really too afraid to get their hands dirty. Yeah, um, yeah, and they're you too know, afraid from the politics, to ever risk from the emotional making, stuff. And they don't want to make because Iron Man was the big hit because uh, Robert Downey Jr. became the face of the MCU for for so much of its lifespan, and they knew it. They just they did not want to risk making him even potentially a little bit. Or well, I mean, like they 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 make him a t- like they risk, but like they they can't go nearly far enough in risking making the audience maybe possibly not sympathize with him a little bit. Yeah, God forbid. Um, and it's like, so how can you have any kind of, y- y- you know, like 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 he's a, he's a a a prick in a lot of that first movie. He is. He's um. He's still a prick. He is, but like now it's like so much more like played to be just purely endearing um, a dick with a heart of and, gold they're really yeah, but, going for but they can't even quite go there like like they just they can't they've got to soften his edges up so much uh because they just are terrified someone might go oh i, I don't like iowa man i don't yeah me don't want i want like iowa man to be movie. my friend it's my like dad. in reality tony stark could give fucking two shits about you he'd he'd probably be like Lick my shoes, bitch. You know. I mean, yeah. Any, anybody in that position, like like the, a billionaire son of a billionaire, uh, uh, huge ego, like hopped up on their own real or perceived genius, like like anybody like that's just gonna be a massive tool. Um, well, it, I mean, Steve, yeah. Steve, Steve Jobs, like massive tool, just huge <laughs> and dick. dead. And dead, and dead by his own hand, basically. Dead because um, he was like, "I refuse radiation treatments. I am just going to drink my green tea smoothie." It, it's funny how many of those like Silicon Valley tech guys are also like kind of new age hippies too. Maybe I don't know about like the Zucker, the the Gen X ones, and later. Maybe, I don't know if there is much, but like, like, like it's a lot of those people are the ones that were like a couple years ago were like into raw water. Yeah, like, like unfiltered, water with a crystal like sewage in it. water, or um, oh, do you remember that juicing machine, that like obscenely expensive, like over, overbuilt but under engineered juicing machine that squeezed proprietary juice packets of gross health crap? What? No. This was I don't know. This was a few years ago. It was like a huge Kickstarter tech startup project that it, it was like it was Theranos for juicers. Um. Kinda, it was, uh, but like, 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 like that, like weird, like, like it's like a weird mix of like the remnants of the West Coast hippie culture combined with like libertarian Randian stuff combined with like your aunt's kooky New Age yeah. ideas. Like, I, well, I mean, there's that famous essay that which I, I need to reread um, because I don't remember the specifics super well, just the general, just but like, you know. Uh, an essay from the mid '90s called "The California Ideology," which is like this emergent, which saw in advance where this kind of converging, forming—I uh, don't even know if ne- like like part like 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 this kind of convergence of hippie liberalism and uh, tech utopianism and like Randian neo-reaction 
individual hyper individualism. Oh yeah, uh, from the all uh, come I don't know together. Which Adam Curtis documentary talks about that? But that's 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 Hi- in at least uh, one Adam Curtis documentary. Uh, all watched over by machines of loving grace. Yes, yes, probably. Um, sidebar: Do you think Tony Stark would smash uh, Elizabeth Holmes? No, no, she's not hot enough. Really? For him? No. Okay. No, she's not. not even though she's not, she's blonde, she's not that hot. Okay. Like he's 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 uh, he's like she's he's also got the funky those, voice. Like, I mean that that voice is an affectation. She oh that's but, like, I she's mean just, she she'd still try to talk in that voice though. <laughs> that'd be that'd be pretty funny. Uh, um. I was trying to think of like a dirty talk to go with that voice, but I was like, I don't want to gross people out. To <laughs> be sexual. Yeah, um, we'll shield our listeners from that. Um, and sort of, I guess. To but kind no, of- she's just she's not she's not hot enough. Okay, I don't think. I mean, and I mean, I mean, I don't know. Fuck Elizabeth Holmes. I don't think she's like ugly, but she's like you know, like like Tony Stark is like it's it's only like women that look like they're fresh off the cover of Max. Yeah, exclusively. Um, so sort of. Kind of continuing on sort of the political aspect, I did find um, sort of to tr- continue the tradition from episode one, I did find a scholarly paper that looks at Iron Man a little bit, um, this time in the context of like the surveillance state and its relationship with multinational corporations. So it looks at Iron Man and Stark Industries as very exemplary of this. Um, and so I managed to pull a couple of quotes. Um, the paper is called Eyes Everywhere, Ecological Migration and State Surveillance in the Age of Iron Man. It is, I'm pretty sure this is this is from uh, Valori Institute of Technology in India. So I think this might be translated because there are some sort of sections that are phrased weirdly. Um, but for the most part, it is it is for free. It is in English. Uh, I was able to find it just by searching Iron Man neoliberalism. I wasted so much money on grad school just to be able to do that. Um, but it it does a good job of really breaking down some of the political and ethical issues at the heart of Iron Man. Um, so on page five, it says the multinational corporation is an essential component of surveillance and has effectively performed its function. The aesthetic strength and, af- and effect of art in camouflaging the politics engaged in its development content and decimation is of great help. The MCU is not only an example of the neoliberal state's relationship with the multinational corporations, but also a careful study of the relationship and an interesting representation of it as well. Um, so it really, there's the most salient part of this paper, it looked at the you know what what we're calling the Benghazi scene because that's that's really the meat of this movie's politics right there at least condensed um on pages five through six it says so in principle in the name of legister bureaucracy national security and patriotism it is the state that is attempting to grab and favor one multinational corporation in this case hammer which they showed the department of defense or at least the the US military is actively contracting Hammer Industries to build its weapons which yeah. explains why all of our weapons don't work I guess which is kind of a self uh, which is one of those moments that's like kind of a self own on like again where the 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 sort of direction of the criticism of this movie gets weird but again we know for a fact that the US military worked in conjunction with the production of both Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2 because there are, like, contracts that were drawn up. There is a paper trail. Um, like, they they were able to film on the air base in California. I forget what the air specific air Edwards, base is called. I believe. Okay. Um, and then on page... Uh, so anyways, yeah, the, the state in this movie is just actively trying to choose one billionaire over the other. The other being Tony Stark, who's just, like, too cool and has too much swag. Like, the United States has to go with the swagless guy, which, again, feels kind of like a cell phone, but we know it's Cause, not. Because he's a, he's a fake billionaire. He, he doesn't earn it. He got there through cronyism. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then on page six, it says, um, cause Tony Stark makes a really big show of this hearing. He's just acting like an absolute dick and the people love him for it. Oh so yeah. He's, 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 he's just clowning taking, on everybody. He's, and... he's taking this, dare I say, billionaire populist position. Like his rhetoric is very like. Like, he would kind of occupy, he, he's doing a Trump thing kind of right now. Like, if Trump was summoned to testify in front of Congress, it would feel like this. Like, he would be making, you know, bitchy, spiteful remarks. Like, God, I, I, I kind of miss that, to be honest. I mean, I, I, he was, I mean, the one thing he should be allowed to do from jail is tweet. Yes, <laughs> um, um but, but anyways, that, like I mean, that is like I think like there is that that, that and I think that they've you you really onto something with the populist billionaire idea because they rely on that a lot, which is like, hey, you hate the government; they're always in your business, telling you what to do, taking your money, b- 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 fucking up at the DMV, blah blah blah. They do that to me too, and I really hate it also. And and look how awesome I am. Yeah, uh, you know, like they tr- like it creates like a false sense of. Um, hey, we both hate the government. The government is bad, but don't think about private power. Don't, right. don't don't think about how I own the phone company that fucks you over and is bureaucratic that you also hate. Well, as and as the paper says on page six, uh, in reference to that scene, the public emerges to take a stance where Stark is held in high respect and the court and Justin Hammer in contempt. But it hardly happens to the crowd that Stark also uses the state system smartly to monopolize the production of guns by trampling on the other lower and weaker rivals. Like, so Stark comes to represent the true interests of the public and the people that the state and that the people or or they're at least initially aren't smart or savvy enough to realize. um, Hence why they're contracting Hammer and the weapons guy as their weapons guy over Tony. So, again, like, muddled, super muddled criticism, but where it's muddled, we kind of know it is very complicit, and it's not, it's, it gestures at trying to say something more insightful or more profound than what it's actually saying, which is billionaire yeah, versus yeah, billionaire. It's, it's yeah, that's, and I mean, that's, that's the thing, like, if you... And this, I think, is what 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 is interesting about picking apart the politics here, because I think, I mean, there's the 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 stuff that's just an ad for the military net that's like, explicit, but then a lot of it, I think, is just, you know, the people who make, you know, there aren't a lot of, especially nowadays, there aren't a lot of, like well-read politically or philosophically or and or working class people who get to shape popular culture at a high level. Um, there never have been, but like, it, it, it's much more insular and nepotistic now than I think it, it, it was like, say, in all of the seventies or eighties. Yeah. Um, and so all, a lot of stuff I think is just implicit. It's just, and that's the thing I think about kind of the, the mainstream of American liberalism is it doesn't even perceive itself as an ideology, which is to, to, um, bastardize uh, Zizek like when you're when you're most ideological is when you don't even perceive yourself as being within or part of ideology you're just looking at it and going well that's just how the world is um and and you know my 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 political beliefs or or my unquestioned assumptions are just facts um and i i think that's kind of what makes it interesting is is it's it reflects kind of the worldview of of the 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 that kind of spectrum from like the upper middle class up to the 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 tippy top uh in particular of how they view the world and i think if you were to talk to like a, any sort of mainstream american liberal progressive especially one who's like at that level or above you would get that kind of muddled like if you were to start picking at it you'd get like a really muddled contradictory worldview where it's like Billionaires should pay their fair share, but they also earned what they have. And I don't trust, I don't like corporations, but I don't trust the government. And, and it's good when corporations do, do good things. And I support it when Disney, 
uh, has a rainbow flag and they're a good progressive corporation. And uh, I like Elon Musk because because he makes the, the cool cars and he's going to save us from from global global warming. Um, I, I can't even conceive of the world in class terms basically at all. And so on. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm doing like a crude caricature, but like, I think like, like, you know, you, most people actually, their politics are kind of contradictory, but I think you talk to like your, your well-meaning average American liberal probably votes Democrat most of the time. Like your, 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 that, that their, their worldview will be that contradictory and will be full of like, like not just contradictory, but like it'll it'll be it, 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 they won't realize it even it's contradictory because it's just resting on all of these assumptions and framings that they've never really questioned. Yeah, which is not to pick on people because that's you know that you, you know you're you, that's what the system conditions you to be and do and think. So I'm not trying to be a dick about it. Like, but wanna... I think like that that's what you get. <laughs> Sorry. Let's. Let's stop talking about Iron Man 2 and talk about something else people should watch, which I told you ahead of time. Yes. Um, please, you know what? Tony Stark is not my Iron Man. My Iron Man is Tetsuo the Iron Man, which is a movie that fucking goes so hard as shit. I just rewatched it last night, and I f- also forgot how gay it is. Like it literally, oh, very, it literally yeah. ends with a homosexual declaration of love. So, and I was just, a, I was like casually looking through homosexual declaration of love. I was just casually looking through sort of letterbox reviews for Iron Man two, just to see what the consensus was. And there was this one person that just kept giving like 4.5, 4.5 and just talking about how like gay Rhodey and Tony are together. And I'm, I'm just like, no, if you want to see a movie with like actual gay shit at the end, that's Tetsuo the Iron Man. <laughs> like two it men rules. literally merge into one. It is if that's not a allegory for gay sex, I don't know what is. There is a drill dick in this movie, people. Oh, it, it's crazy. Uh, it, it rules. I don't. It's like a movie that's hard to describe without both spoiling things, and also it's just like you you can't already have to have seen it to even make sense of it because it's very. Um, it's it's entirely in a league of its own. Yeah, it's it, but it's it's a it's a it's one of those movies. Even if you don't like it, you will you will not forget it. It will it will leave an impression on you. It's like um, which it, which I think is more valuable than just being like passively entertained most of the time. It's like if Akira had fucked Eraserhead, kind of is is what I would describe as just sort of the layman. Um. Like you get again, this this movie came out in like nineteen ninety, I think. So this was after yeah, Akira. 80, 89, 90. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's after black Akira, and white, obviously and it's after Racerhead. Um, lots very, of like lo- very low. Sorry, it's okay. Very do it yourself in a lot of aspects. A lot of stop motion techniques. Uh, the practical effects are they're just so orgiastic in the use of metal and prostheses and it's it's shot in black and white so you and on like a lower millimeter camera i'm i'm not sure what millimeter camera they use but it it gives everything like a grainy yeah. gritty like quality it's it's very um it is in some ways kind of has like superhero elements in it, its story. It is a superhero like it kind of moves from in a, in a I was yeah, thinking it, of it yeah, as a superhero. It movie. moves from body horror to being kind of a superhero slash anti superhero, like Tokusatsu movie, and it's I don't know, it's it's a hard movie to describe, but it you know it's probably if you if you know how to use the internet, uh, it's on YouTube. Probably, the whole it's thing's on, on YouTube. Just a, you can just watch it on YouTube. Oh hell yeah, yeah just on, watch it on YouTube. Yeah, it's not like. HD quality, but I I did watch it on YouTube. I I want to get a Blu-ray copy of it really bad because it is that is another perf like in my opinion perfect movie because it it does a lot of really great things with its uh, sound editing and sound design, oh, which is something is I really wild. like about David Lynch. Like if you watch Racerhead, you can't or his early shorts. Like, the emphasis on sound design, like, he would do all his own sound design back in the day. Like, he still does a lot of sound work, but really his early work was, you know, that was him 
cutting in, you know, making noise and shit. So the sound design of this movie is also absolutely insane. Um, did I mention there is a drill dick? Oh, yeah, there's a drill dick. There is a drill dick, people. Like, come on. I mean, like, really, like, honking huge. It's, it's, it's so a big. Movie. And it is always erect. Um, it is, yeah, it's it's a great fusion of a superhero narrative and a body horror narrative. Um, like, it is it is one of the most heavy metal movies you will ever see. It, it goes so hardcore. Although I haven't seen either of the sequels. And to my understanding, the uh, two sequels are I- very much uh less than uh three i'm told is bad two um body hammer uh i've seen that one that one's it's not as good as the original it's more of a actually more of a superhero movie it's still like it's i think it's still very much a solid watch i would i would say watch uh tetsuo 2 body hammer uh it's still got a lot of style got a lot of fun stuff um I've told three is terrible uh, by yeah, everyone's taste, I, I trust. I don't, I have no interest in seeing three. Um, and I guess other alternatives, just in the sense of like better movie sequels, which are much more rare, but they do exist. Like we already mentioned Spider-Man 2, which I haven't watched that in a long ass time, but I, but like that, I, I feel like if I sat down and rewatched Spider-Man 2, it would still really hit with me. Um, Granted, a lot of people are having Tobey Maguire nostalgia because of No Way Home still, like, selling out theaters across the country to just tons and tons of people who are probably going to get Omicron. <laughs> um, but, you know, Spider-Man 2, and of course, like, you, you can't mention movie sequels without mentioning either, like, Aliens or Terminator 2. Um, but you don't I, don't, I don't think our audience needs us to tell them to go see two movies they probably have or you know, should really say I mean, like a, a Terminator's a Terminator is kind of an Iron Man. Yeah. If you think about it. Yeah. I mean, they, they do. I, I mean, to the extent that like all or like most action cinema now owes a lot to Terminator, at least in, in the sort of modern iteration of like the sci-fi action crossover, like Terminator. I mean, two, two yeah. was like, you can like bookend like the nineties with Terminator two at the start and matrix at the end, like Terminator yes, two was like the, the definitive uh, pre matrix action movie. I think like the, the accumulation of everything that came before it and setting the stage for everything that came after up to that point. Um, uh, I, that's very true. I mean, I, I wonder like, if we're at a, like, it's hard to say that because you think about all the movies are just like, oh, these are obvious classics. Everyone's seen them. But then it's like, if we're, I don't know how much of our audience are Zoomers, quote unquote. But I don't know if like. My friends like are. People, Hi, guys. <laughs> like, like if you're like born like after 98, 99, 2000, whatever, like, d- did you grow up with, with like these, these like James Cameron movies and stuff the way we did like is is terminator or terminator 2 a classic for you um or or have you bothered to watch i honestly don't know i mean Um, a lot of my uh, a good chunk of my zoomer friends are are pretty movie savvy i haven't asked them i mean i think i feel like they'd have to be (laughs) yeah i mean i haven't asked them their opinion about terminator 2 but i mean i i watched it earlier God, it's it's still weird to refer to 2021 as last year, but I, I watched it in 2021 with my mom and my sister. Um, yes, I that is that is that is that movie has the distinction of being a family friendly movie to me, my mom and my sister, who yes, I oh, I finally got to get them to rewatch not only the Grinch, Jim Carrey Grinch with me, but the fucking cat in the hat. We did that over Christmas break. Oh, so that yeah. that joins Terminator 2 joins the league of, or, or at least could be filed under the same sort of uh, family friendly movie night as fucking Grinch and Cat in the Hat. Honestly, like Terminator 2, like R rated, but I feel like it's kind of a soft R, like especially in comparison mm, to the first Terminator. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like, it, it's it's got a bit of blood and guts, but it, it's it it's mostly like I f- I feel like you could almost make it a PG thirteen. Like I mean, it it's not a it's not a gore fest, and I wouldn't say that because it's got, a, like, it's I got feel a like, couple moments, but it's 
pretty like especially compared to the first Terminator, which is like definitely has like a harder, meaner uh edge to it. Um I think you could show I mean like I mean I grew up like my media intake was basically uncensored. A lot of the like R rated classics I saw before I hit double digits. Um so my sense of like what's appropriate for children is a little skewed, maybe. Yeah. Cause like I saw like I saw Terminator 2 as a baby and I watched it a bunch. Like I don't remember the, my first time seeing it, because my first time seeing it was like as an infant. Like it was just always there. It, <laughs> just, came out, it came out the year I was whereas, born. It's whereas like other me. parents, like my parents would just sit me down in front of fucking Sesame Street. Your parents were just sitting you down in front of Terminator 2. <laughs> Oh, I, I'll tell you what. You know what's a movie I grew up with on tape watching all the time from baby age? Uh, Salo or The 120 Days of Sodom? Oh, okay, no. Um, but uh, Total Recall. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, you the mentioned Verhoeven that. Total Recall with Arnold. Another, another. Actually, that's, um, I think it's a bit of an underrated Verhoeven between Robocop and Starship Troopers. Yeah, I need to uh, rewatch Total Recall. It. I, I rewatched that recently ton of fun lots of great practical stuff and sets and and props and, and imaginative action uh it's like on paper it shouldn't work you know arnold in a philip k dick adaptation that just kind of becomes a but it you know it's it's verhoven so he pulls He's these playing disparate elements guy yeah but he pulls these disparate elements together in a way that is um really great that's that's, uh, that's verhoven baby Great, yeah. So, Total Recall. Uh, just as an aside, great movie. I was gonna say I'm I'm gonna recommend the Venture Brothers again, just because the the Tony Stark dad stuff reminded me so much of that, and it's so so much better and, and more interesting in Venture Brothers as like pathos for dark comedy. Um, and I wanted to recommend. I mentioned also this earlier. Um, just in terms as being like a a movie scored by Joe Strummer of the Clash, and being like instead of mealy like mealy mouthed criticizing little tiny bits of American empire, but mostly saying it's like good and uh, American socialism or um, American exceptionalism that uh, the, the very darkly funny, very stylish, very angry, very, very firmly anti-imperialist film Walker. I'm going to um, have to watch that. Repo Man director Alex Cox. Oh, now I'm uh, really going to have to watch that. Starring uh, Ed Harris. Oh, hell yeah. As, um, in a, yeah, in a, in a, like I said, a darkly comic, stylized, deliberately anachronistic telling of a true story of a, a guy named uh, William Walker, I want to say. It says William who, in, Walker. I'm looking up the yeah, letterbox in, page. In the mid 1800s. Uh, participated in one of a number of what they called filibustering expeditions where small groups of American kind of adventurers and mercenaries would try and overthrow Latin American governments to make them basically colonies of the U.S. Ooh. And he installed himself as president of Nicaragua for a few years and uh, reinstated slavery, among other <gasps> things. Um, oh, this sounds uh, sick. Not it's not a, not slavery, a, guys. Don't take me out of context. But, but this, the movie, this movie, it's it's an it's an awesome movie. Okay, I, I I'll watched have to it watch um, that. last year. It was, it was a recommendation from uh, Twitter friends Viperwave and and Nosticet. Hi, um, Rocky. And God, what a great movie! Just a, a, a speaking of perfect movies, like it it killed Alex Cox's career because it's like. It's 1986, I think it came out, and you're and they, they made this movie in Nicaragua with the support of the Sandinista government at the time. What? Um, that? Oh hell yeah! And like, I don't know, like I I don't even know how this movie got made, but it's incredible. But like in 1986, at like peak of Re- or 86 or 87 is like peak of Reaganism, and it, it was a hard sell to get people to watch this like very like weird tonally um out kind of like stylistically a little bit out there movie that is just like aggressively telling you that America are the bad guys. <laughs> that okay. Well I know what but my it next rules. video it's, underground rental it's, will be. Oh it's awesome. Like just an, an absolute must see just outstanding movie that just was completely overlooked in its time and I think is still not that especially well known even among movie people. Um, okay, it's I will fantastic. Definitely have to watch this. Um, all right. Well, I think I think that does it for 
episode four of Marvelous or the Death of Cinema. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm uh, Tyrell James, a.k.a. Discourse Stew. Um, and thank you so much again for, for joining us, for giving us a listen. Um, if, if you like the show, please subscribe. We're on rate, Spotify now. And things. We are? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, we should be up basically everywhere that matters. Um, and if we're not up there yet, like the algorithms that scrub stuff should put us there in the near future. Um, hope uh, if, whoever's listening you had a great holidays, having a good start to your 2022. Um, Dodge that seasonal depression. Uh, yeah, get your UV lights going. Um, don't watch Iron yeah. Man two. <laughs> don't watch. Oh, don't watch Iron Man two. Don't. Don't, don't even look at it. These, <laughs> don't watch any of these movies, really. Or if you're going to, just like do them in the way that gives a little or no money to uh, Disney. Um, watch it on fmovies.com, which is what I did. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I do I do not support uh, uh, illegal streaming. This is a disclaimer. Wing, I, wing. I, don't su- I don't support illegal streaming either because it's just so inferior to a, like a good Blu-ray rip torrent. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to say this public service announcement. Everyone out there, if you don't know like how to torrent stuff, <laughs> learn <laughs> like like I feel like it's 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 becoming a lost capacity and we need to bring it back as a way of fighting back against uh, media monopolies and streaming and like censored episodes of shows and stuff getting modified or taken off of services. Like, you know, physical copies of things are good too, but like just unaltered share, like, like uh, Beavis and Butthead, you, you, you can't legally watch Beavis and Butthead the way it was broadcast because of all the licensed music and stuff. So every version of it that exists on DVD or Blu-ray or streaming or anywhere is like all janked up. But thanks to the magic of piracy, um, you can watch it as originally aired with all the music and music videos and everything. If you know where to look and, you know, I mean, I think for art and for culture, that is important. Um, all right. Well, I'm never going to only- learn how to see <laughs> It's also the only way how to uh, you can watch uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion with um with the Fly Me to the Moon EDs. Oh, that's true. At the way it's meant to be seen. That's true. Um. um anyways, sayonara, guys. Uh, das Voidanya. All right, we're out, guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.